Check one, two. Check test one, two, check one, two, check test one, two. Check test one, two, check one, two. Little more. Check one, two. Check test one, two, check one, two. 
I won't. I'll show you the, I'll show you the ones. It, it, it's, it's fine. You know what? I'm not worried about it. I'm not going to worry about it. It'll be fine. Can we turn it off? Sure. We might have secrets. 
Let's ask uh, the gentleman. No. Excuse me, guys. Yeah, the, the mic. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us and welcome to the David C. Hardesty Jr. Festival of Ideas at West Virginia University. This lecture is co-sponsored by the Tanner Lecture Series. And I'd also like to, to welcome those of you who are watching our live webcast. David Hardesty organized the first Festival of, of Ideas when he was a student leader here. I'm not gonna say how long ago that was. Um, when he became university president in 1997, he relaunched the festival, which now spans the academic year and engages a diverse group of newsmakers, public figures, thought leaders, and WVU's own superstars. David and Susan, thank you both for your generous support of the festivals, and let's give them a round of applause, please. Today's event is also co-sponsored by the Tanner Lecture Series and is creating a community of learners by engaging students, faculty, staff, and the Morgantown area in an academically driven experience. Thank you to Mrs. Tanner and her family for their support, particularly related to mental health. Thank you. Thank you. At the end of the lecture, there'll be a brief question and answer period, but now I'd like to welcome Dr. Jan, John Campo to the podium. We are pleased that Dr. Campo has joined us here at West Virginia University. This speaks to the culture that President Gee, Dean Marsh, sorry, Clay Marsh, and Dr. Ali Rezai of the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute have created that enables us to recruit such world-class leaders in their fields. Dr. Campo is currently the Assistant Dean for Behavioral Health, Chief Behavioral Wellness Officer, and Professor of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry here at West Virginia University and the Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute. Dr. Campo is board certified in pediatrics, psychiatry, and child and adolescent psychiatry. He completed his medical training at the University of Pennsylvania and did residencies at pediatrics at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia and psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry at Western Psych University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He is a former Sensabaugh professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at The Ohio State University. <laughs> Sorry. And chief of child and adolescent psychiatry, and medical director of behavioral health at Nationwide Children's Hospital. He's been honored by the, Acad the Academy of uh, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Dr. Campo's interests include study and prevention of suicide, as well as mental health services and policy research. We are so fortunate that he's joined us and that he's going to speak to us today about suicide prevention. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Campo. Thank you. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Dr. Halp. I'm, um, I'm, it's really a privilege to be here and uh, it's been a short time, but it really is, uh, uh, it really is among friends. Uh, West Virginia has welcomed me uh, and uh, my wife, Ronnie, so very warmly, and we're so grateful uh, to you for that. Um, in fact, I think this topic is a topic that really helped me um, make the decision to move to West Virginia, and we'll maybe talk a little bit about that in a minute. Let's begin. Um, you know, like all lectures, I want to um, talk about uh, what our objectives are today. Uh, first is really, I just want to review with y'all a bit about the public health reality of suicide and its impact across the lifespan, um, as well as how it impacts us geographically here in the United States uh, and also in West Virginia. Um, going to talk a little bit uh, to that end about the potential overlap between deaths that are attributed to drug overdose and those that are attributed to suicide. Talk a little bit about uh, risk factors associated with suicide risk. Chat a little bit about some prevention strategies and, and hopefully with y'all to um, finish up and try to think 
um, big about ways that we can take suicide seriously here in West Virginia and at WVU uh, and really uh, uh, be a light um, to the rest of the state and, and, and hopefully beyond that. Now, uh, it is, um, I, I suppose, uh, a, a coincidence that I'm, I'm speaking with you today on um, September 11th. And um, I think we all, uh, all of us old enough anyway, remember where we were um, on that day and um, that it had. Um, um, couple of particularly troubling pictures. There's someone falling to their death out of the tower. Um, so that was a tragedy that, um, you know, was kind of burned into all of our memories and it was responsible for uh, nearly 3,000 deaths that day. Uh, so let's talk about suicide. Um, in 2016, the last year we have really solid data for uh, there were almost 45,000 deaths from suicide. That is 15 uh, 9-11s, okay? Uh, over 120 suicide deaths a day in the United States. Um, and, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I've been talking about suicide for a while. But every time I do and I just look at the numbers, uh, it is truly shocking you know and um and and on some level i want you to feel that 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 shock because this is a shocking problem if ever there was a marker for living in a fallen world uh it would it would be suicide since 2000 there have been almost half a million deaths um uh, wait a minute now i'm sorry almost half a million deaths um in the united states from suicide probably about um, uh, 800,000 deaths a year in the world from suicide. Uh, if you look how it stacks up in terms of uh, cause of death, second leading cause of death, ages 10 to 34, fourth leading, 35 to 54, eighth, across the lifespan, it's 10th. Um, this is another slide that uh, again, the visual, I think, maybe gives you a sense of the impact uh, and the disproportionate impact that suicide has on the lives of young people. Um, so, uh, you know, about two years ago, I had the privilege of going back. Um, uh, Mark was saying how I had trained originally in pedi pediatrics. I had the privilege of going back to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and, and doing a talk. And this is one of the things that I chose to speak about. And one of the first things I did was I showed them this pie chart, which takes really the, the really major causes of death in childhood. And I put it into a little pie chart here. And what I said is, you see that little slice right there? That little slice, less than a quarter, that's what we learned to take care of at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And that's what we learned to take care of in medicine. And when you look, it's certainly in this age group, that's what kills kids. Accidents, suicide, violence. Um, if you go through, and, and I've done, if you go through the CDC website and you start adding up different causes of death and you look, um, again, it's something I know, but it's shocking. Suicide kills more young people in that age group than cancer than diabetes, than cardiovascular disease, than respiratory disease, asthma, and cystic fibrosis, than HIV and AIDS, than sepsis, than meningitis, than pneumonia, than influenza combined. Add them all together, more young people die every year from suicide, okay? Go to ages 25 and 34. Um, you know, we're, we're surrounded by students and trainees and people trying to move to the next phase in their life. What kills people in that age group? Same stuff, right? Okay. Now, not only might there be some variability by age in suicide, there is geographic variability. And I think that's particularly important for us here in West Virginia. And I'm gonna uh, try and um, uh, drill down a little bit about that. If you look at the US suicide rate in uh, 2016, 
it's 13.4 per 100,000 population. It's age adjusted, okay? Um, that was what the suicide rate was in about 1950. We had a couple of decades where the suicide rate was coming down. It kind of bottomed out in the late 90s. But since around 1999, 2000, it has been climbing up again. Which states, I mean, I, you have the, um, um, uh, the map here. But I think that there's a lot on, on, on this map that at least for me would have surprised me. I think if I had asked many of you before and said, gee, which state in America has the highest suicide rate? I don't, I don't know many of us would have guessed Montana, you know? Uh, and then if I said, well, geez, which state has the lowest suicide rate? New Jersey? Come on, when has New Jersey ever led in anything, right? There, there you go, there you have it. But it's, it, and, 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 you know, it's like, here I am in West Virginia, and I'm envying New Jersey. It kills me, um, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Now, um, West Virginia, where do we stack up? We're 11th, okay? Our uh, population-based suicide rate is 19.3. Um, one of the things that's exciting, though, about being here is that we have something on the order of a boundary population. We've got 1.8, 1.9 million people. So right now, if you believe these numbers, we're 11th highest in the country, but we're the highest east of the Mississippi. Um, if we can move the needle, it will have an impact, and uh, it could be an example to other places. Um, I want to talk a minute about overdose deaths. Um, our own uh, Ian Rocket. Uh, who's done some very uh, good work here and, and just retired this year. Ian, unfortunately, wasn't able to be here today, but uh, Ian's um, really, for years, been interested in, gee, do we classify suicide properly? So if we look again, same year, 2016, had uh, over 63,000 drug overdose deaths. Um, a U.S. overdose death rate that's actually higher than the death rate from suicide in 2016. And, you know, here is one uh, area where we lead, where we don't want to lead. We, our overdose death rate, 52 per 100,000, uh, is the highest in the nation. I think the closest second is Ohio, which I think is about 39 per 100,000. Uh, so we're highest in the United States, followed by a couple of other states, many of them with Appalachian uh, populations. Um, the problem is with overdose deaths, it is exceptionally difficult to uh, discern volition. Uh, is this an unintentional overdose or is it a suicide? We know that people who, who suffer from opioid use disorders and substance use disorders are at greater risk for suicide. They're at greater risk for a whole variety of other mental disorders. Um, so you'd have to assume that there's a continuum of intent in people who die from overdose, from on the one hand, I am going to kill myself with heroin because I'd rather do that than, than shoot myself, to complete and total accident. There's a spectrum, and I think there are a number of folks on the in-between who are pretty miserable, and they're getting high. It's like, eh, if I get a little too high, so what? So the question is, what's a reasonable estimate? Well, um, you know, if you look, violent deaths, they're more likely classified as suicide than drug overdose deaths, than, than, a, than a heroin overdose. Uh, if you don't have a note, it's very tough to, uh, to classify this. So, so what do we do? Well, the best estimates out there, and people are starting to call attention to this. It was just a, a, a great uh, editorial in the New England Journal. On, um, on this issue that uh, overdoses may be masking a significant number of, uh, of suicides, um, probably the best estimate is about 20 to 30% of drug overdoses are in fact deliberate, uh, um, um, they're suicides. Um, and uh, some studies, if you look at people who survived uh, near miss overdoses in the ED, uh, seem to support that 20% is probably uh, a conservative number. So let's, so I went back, let's did a little bit of calculation, said, well, what if 20% of US overdose rates are suicide? Well, then, you know, instead of almost 45,000 deaths in 2016, 
suicide death rate is higher. Uh, uh, the West Virginia suicide death rate now becomes probably the highest in the U U.S., followed closely by the big Western states. Um, so again, more bad news here. The U.S. suicide rate, I told you, has been increasing over the last 15 years. Uh, it's increased about 25%. West Virginia's increased even a little bit more than that. And if you look at all 50 states, 49 of 50 states have experienced an increase in the suicide rate. This is a slide from some of our recent work. This is one of the slides, um, th this paper is under review now. The lead author is a lovely young woman by the name of uh, Danielle Steelsmith, who I worked with in Ohio when she was um, a postdoc or actually working on her PhD. Um, let me just talk you through this slide. This basically looks um, from early uh, 2000 to close to present. And what, and what you're seeing with the different colors uh, are expressions of standardized mortality ratios based on the numbers from 2000. So basically a standardized mortality ratio gives you observed to expected deaths from whatever, here it's suicide. Uh, so standard mortality ratios less than one means that the rate in your county, and this, these are county level data, is uh, less than expected. If it's greater than one, it's more than expected, right? And so the highest uh, SMRs are, are in, the, in like the dark brown, the dark red, the lowest are in the blue. And if you just walk, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very easy visual, right? You, you, here's where we start in 2000, and here's what happens. And if you look where the dark red areas, the brown areas are, okay, the big Western states, the Ozarks and Appalachia. Um, and there's something to this. I mean, if you're looking at this, you're saying, gee, you know, there's something about uh, living in states that are more rural or counties that are more rural. And um, using that data set that we use to build those charts, we went, we went through and we tried to look for correlates of being in a county with uh, with higher level suicide rates and higher uh, standardized mortality ratios. What were the things we found? Well, the kind of things you might expect. Uh, measures of deprivation, lower levels of education, employment, income, and housing. Evidence of social fragmentation, more in the way of single parent houses, divorce, uh, residential impermanence. Number of per capita gun shops. Um, and then if you classified counties across the, uh, the uh, rural urban continuum, um, rural rates were higher and increasing the most rapidly. And again, especially in the West, in Appalachia and in the Ozarks. Now, there were a couple of other, other things that were interesting as we went and we looked at the interactions between level uh, of rurality, if that's a word, um, and things like deprivation. What was interesting to us was that the more rural your county, the more vulnerable that county is to the effects of economic deprivation. I'm going to show you a slide uh, that, that maybe gives you a visual of that. The, the flip side was we looked at the same thing with gun shops. Interestingly, the number of gun shops didn't move things as much in rural areas. It, it, it had more of an impact in metropolitan areas. We also found that um, lower rates, the things that seem to be protective, this is about like the, you don't get a lot of times where you say it's good to be a psychiatrist. I guess when we looked at per capita psychiatrist and density of health and mental health services, uh, it is associated with, uh, with uh, lower uh, suicide rates. So that's fundamentally a good thing. And then something that I, that I, I know will resonate with, uh, with uh, uh, Dean Marsh is that you know, any measure that we put together an index of social capital, it's protective, right? The more a given county had um, uh, markers for philanthropy, civic, social, religious activities, um, the lower uh, the suicide rates. And again, this is just the visual. Uh, if you hold deprivation uh, uh, at the average level, you see the, uh, a higher slope for rural areas. If you kind of let it run free and you break down the sample, 
interestingly, over time, for some reason in metropolitan areas, um, it, it, the, the impact uh, is less dramatic than in rural areas. So rural areas, uh, the impact of that kind of change is profound. This is basically a, a map of Ohio. We were able to drill down in Ohio, did a geospatial map of suicide clusters in Ohio. What does it say? Essentially the same thing, socioeconomic deprivation, social fragmentation, lower densities of mental health providers were, um, uh, were uh, uh, associated with being it in a, in a high suicide cluster. The clusters, three of them were large rural clusters, Appalachian clusters. Six of them were small urban clusters in, in pretty deprived areas. So what are some other things about, about suicide that I think are relevant as we start to think about things like prevention? Well, uh, age, right? So uh, suicide rates in general, they roughly increase with increasing age, certainly into adolescence and young adulthood and across the way. Uh, older and middle-aged um, um, adults uh, kill themselves at rates higher than younger folks, though what the slide I showed you previously is that as a cause of death, suicide kills a greater percentage of younger people. Highest suicide rates by age, 45 to 54, and then um, uh, the elderly, particularly uh, really, really elderly um, men. Um, no surprise, males uh, uh, kill themselves uh, at much higher rates than, than females, and the males, male risk is at least three times as high as the female risk, and you just get a little bit of a sense from here, and that's true across, uh, across ages. Now, um, the context here, I think uh, probably a, a lot of the folks in this room have been reading about Deaths of Despair that uh, Case and Deaton wrote about, um, and we know that there's been this unprecedented shift in uh, US age-specific mortality. So again, since the late 90s, for middle-aged non-Hispanic US whites with lower levels of education, mortality is going up. And for the first time, the, uh, the lines are crossing here. Uh, for the first time, we're seeing life expectancy at birth ha has actually seemed to go down for white uh, non-Hispanics. Uh, and uh, Case and Deaton called uh, attention to how mortality tracks with a number of different areas uh, uh, of what they refer to as uh, broadly as, as um, uh, social dysfunction or sort of cumulative deprivation, decline in marriage, and a variety of other things, including changing uh, religious um, uh, practices. What about uh, race and ethnicity? Again, no surprises here. Uh, uh, suicide rates the highest in uh, Native Americans and American Indians and uh, Alaskan Natives. Um, whites, uh, non-Hispanic, uh, right behind, uh, followed then by a cluster of Hispanic, African American, and Asian. Um, one interesting finding, and again, this was this was our work. Jeff Bridge uh, had the lead on this. The one place that we've uh, learned that actually the suicide rate for blacks is higher than for whites is for is is for um, kids younger than 13. And interestingly, what we found is that um, uh, the black to white uh, ratio is about two to one. And then as th when puberty comes, it flips back to where it was before and whites are higher again. I can't tell you why. Um, we can speculate about it, but it's a real finding and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, become increasingly so over the past decade. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what those of us who are in psychiatry and behavioral health uh, are, are most familiar with. And those are some health factors that are associated with, um, with suicide. Uh, mental disorders. So mental disorders um, uh, are present in over 90% of completed suicides if you do uh, psychological autopsies. Um, these are probably, we think, among the more remediable risk factors for suicide. Uh, if you have multiple disorders, it's associated with increased risk, but mood disorders really powerful. 
Schizophrenia, which we tend not to think about so much, about 10% of schizophrenics over the lifespan kill themselves. Um, uh, and, and again, uh, alcohol and substance use disorders. Uh, these disorders are highly prevalent. Uh, they often begin early in life and they're not easily detected. Um, again, misuse of alcohol and drugs beyond the disorder itself, the acute and chronic use of substances and alcohol increases risk for a variety of reasons. If you're, uh, you know, if you look at people who have completed suicide, uh, many, many, many of them, certainly in adolescence, sometimes the majority um, have uh, evidence of uh, using a, a alcohol or an illicit substance at the time of death. Uh, and, you know, uh, those of us who've worked in the ED, I'll tell you, there are people who can come in who are intoxicated, who are intensely suicidal. You let them sober up and that wanes as well. So um, uh, it, it can intensify the thinking and it can also increase the likelihood of impulsivity. A number of physical health uh, conditions, particularly those that affect the brain. Traumatic brain injury has the, uh, the largest odds ratios here are associated with heightened risk for suicide, even if you control for mental disorders. Now, uh, again, I, I, I hesitated about putting this slide. This is a well-known picture uh, called Falling Man from 9-11. Um, uh, and I put it next to uh, a quote by David Foster Wallace, the, uh, uh, the uh, novelist, the author who um, killed himself a number of years back in his mid 40s. Um, but uh, I, I thought that the parallel he draws, this is a guy, uh, David Foster Wallace, who suffered from mood disorder um, much of his life and uh, I think suffered pretty terribly. And his comment about suicide, uh, well, you could read it, but I'll read part of it to you anyway. Uh, the person in whom its invisible agony reaches a certain unendurable level will kill herself the same way a trapped person will eventually jump from the window of a burning high rise. Their terror of falling from a great height is still just as great. The variable here is the other terror, the fire's flames. That's certainly one view of, of, of suicide and how for some individuals it's, a, it's an effort to, uh, um, to escape um, uh, some very intense pain. What are some other factors associated with increased suicide risk? Uh, again, previous attempts definitely increase your risk. Um, what we find though is that uh, for every completed suicide, there are about 25 attempts. Um, lifetime prevalence of non-fatal attempts about 5%. There are a couple of important caveats here. And um, the point I want to make here is it's really critical for us to prevent first attempts. Why? Most people who die by suicide die in the first attempt. Over half of people who die by suicide are successful time one. Okay, That's especially true if you use a firearm. Right? Um, now, of those who do attempt, they're at greater risk. But it's also important to know that most people who have attempted at least once will not die of suicide. Only one out of 10 will eventually die of suicide. But there's something about walking through that door once that uh, is problematic. And I think it, it really behooves us to try and prevent those first attempts. We know family history of completed suicide is real. And that, uh, and that is more than just an environmental or an experiential thing. There seems to be a biological component to that. And it seems like um, a family history of completed suicide tracks more with impulsive aggression than it does with mood problems. Sexual minority status uh, and actually early sexual abuse appears to be associated with increased suicide risk as well. Another area that I, that I know is uh, dear to, uh, to Clay's heart is the whole issue of adverse childhood experiences, right? These definitely increase risk of suicide, physical and sexual maltreatment, neglect other childhood trauma. And the thing that's so troubling about adverse childhood experiences is that in dealing with the things that we're talking about, like suicide and violence and drug overdoses, there is a very um, um, painful feedback loop where adverse childhood experiences put you at greater risk. And then the event actually increases the likelihood of adverse childhood experiences. 
Uh, again, stressful life events in the here and now, exposure, contagion, these are all risk factors for suicide. Access to lethal means. Uh, in the United States, we're a little different. About half of people in the United States who kill themselves do so with a firearm. Uh, but there is definitely a, um, a sex difference there. Uh, males are uh, more likely to use firearms. Uh, females more likely to choose poisoning uh, or suffocation. Now, suffocation cuts across both. Uh, what we found is as the female suicide rate has gone up, what, what's happened is I think that the rate of suffocation has gone up. Um, we also know that firearm suicide is uh, less likely to be set, uh, associated with mental disorders, excuse me, than some of the other methods. It's, it, it tracks more with impulsivity. Um, it's, 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 it's lethal and irreversible. Uh, and also increased associations with, with things like head injury, which these veterans coming back, it's, uh, it's a very troubling, um, troubling thought. Okay. Um, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about there are times associated with heightened suicide risk. What are those? About, um, uh, you know, release from jail or prison after inpatient psychiatric treatment or discharge, after being in the emergency room uh, for deliberate self-harm. These are all um, risk factors. Uh, again, some uh, protective factors we've talked about. I wanna move on and, and spend um, a good uh, 10 or 15 talking about some suicide prevention strategies. Um, and again, when you think about prevention strategies, you could break them down a variety of different ways. Uh, but you talk about universal strategies, which are population-wide, selective strategies, which target groups that are at higher risk, and then indicated strategies that, that drill down on individuals. Now, a given method uh, can be relevant all across. And so, for example, uh, you know, reducing access to firearms could be applicable at any of these levels. Um, the one area where we think about it the most is right around here. So... What are some of the challenges we face trying to direct suicide prevention efforts because we're not doing so great? Um, well, a lot of our inferences are based on observational data. Uh, it's vulnerable to confounding. Um, there's a low base rate of suicide. So if you really want to study whether you did an intervention and does it help prevent suicide, you need huge samples. Um, the other thing is most uh, IRBs and most uh, folks who review studies traditionally have been very fearful of uh, dealing with individuals who are at suicide risk and they'd rather not do the study. Most RCTs for things like depression, most randomized controlled trials have excluded suicidal patients. So the patients that probably could benefit the most, we exclude them because we're afraid of the, uh, the potential complexities of doing the study. And then finally, it's a multi-determined complex problem. Uh, so in order to, to um, make a difference, we're probably gonna need to uh, go at this uh, from a variety of different angles. Again, um, a lot of strategies here in the United States, uh, just really uh, going over this quickly, uh, the first attempt at a national strategy for suicide prevention, what did we do? It seemed to make sense. Let's identify people who are, who are at high risk, typically people with mental disorders or addictions. We're gonna identify them, we're gonna treat them, and uh, hopefully we'll reduce the suicide rate. Except it hasn't happened. If anything, the rate's gone up. Uh, hard to know why that is. I don't know that that's necessarily a bad strategy, but it hasn't rung the bell. Um, we are now moving to, uh, uh, to try and improve on that um, there's been this adoption of zero suicide, uh, basically uh, an approach that, that treats suicide deaths in healthcare settings as preventable. And, uh, you know, essentially the, uh, the only um, uh, acceptable number of suicides is zero. Can we get there? That's an empirical question, right? Um, but the, the whole idea here is to take a more public health driven approach and, and move from focusing on individuals to seeing how can we actually move the number for populations. 
So there's good news, right? Suicide rates are negatively correlated with um, uh, indicators of access to health and, and behavioral health services. And you know, um, you don't have to take my word for it. There are uh, some studies that, that really do support this at the population level. But again, they're observational studies. Um, but we can say there are suicide prevention strategies out there that have been demonstrated, um, including in some uh, randomized control trials, to be effective. But there's bad news too, right? Most people at risk for suicide are unrecognized. We talked a little bit about how most people who die from suicide die in the first attempt. Uh, most people at risk don't get any treatment. And many uh, who do get treatment, it's inadequate. It's inappropriate. So what do we know? We know access to service is critical to prevention, but then how do we get there? Well, there are all sorts of barriers to care. There are two types of barriers. There are structural barriers and attitudinal barriers, right? Um, we all worry about lack of financial means, insurance restrictions. Uh, however, what I can tell you is even when you have means doesn't guarantee that you get access to good care. Geography, transportation, even more important in rural areas. And then training, experience, and um, 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 uh, basically the skill of providers. There's diversity. Most mental health providers haven't gotten specific training in suicide prevention. And there are big issues with uh, shortages of providers and uh, what I call segregated systems of care. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that, and I'll show you on this slide, if you look, um, about 80% of patients with mental health and addiction problems at least present in the general medical sector, where only about 5% of behavioral health specialists work, right? We all work in specialty settings where only about 20% of the patients show up. So there's a mismatch between where the specialists are and where the patients are. And we have just not found a way to do better. We're trying, but we aren't there yet. And um, uh, the need to really break down these barriers is, is, is critical in both directions. So I, I wanna talk a little bit more now about attitudinal barriers to care. And there at the top of the list is really our distorted thinking about the problem. I just went through and talked to you um, probably ad nauseum about the impact of suicide, how common it is, uh, what an important uh, cause of death it is from a public health perspective. But uh, when, you, when you look around and you say, well, gee, you know, that we aren't getting people into care, why is it that we're not uh, taking the problem more seriously? I think how we think about it is probably number one. The other problem is that mental disorders uh, get in the way of their own treatment, right? Somebody who's hopeless, somebody who um, uh, is uh, incredibly anxious, these, these are more difficult people to treat. So are we thinking clearly about it? You know, we, we, um, we, we think about things uh, in the way that we've been trained, right? So um, only recently, I've really started to think differently about how we do things in our emergency departments. So here's some questions, right, for, for folks here. Why are hospital emergency departments and general medical settings so often ill-equipped to meet the needs of patients at high risk, right? Why is it that we train our physicians to do a better job taking care of asthma, diabetes, cancer, uh, or th than, uh, than some of these other problems? And why is it that those of us who work in this field, that the number one rationale for what we do is cost offset? Cost offset's important, but in any other um, um, physical uh, uh, illness or any other healthcare setting, it's the suffering of the patient, the impact of the problem um, that really, uh, and the threat to life that we really um, pay attention to. And why is there this mismatch between um, the public health impact of the problem and our commitment to prevention? So what do we know? We know that there are strategies out there to prevent suicide. There are a number of interventions, safety planning interventions. 
you would think that every emergency department and every inpatient psychiatric unit is doing safety planning. We say we are, but safety planning, as I describe it here, is a process that can take, you know, 45 minutes sitting down with folks. I can promise you most uh, mental health settings are not doing safety planning. Most emergency departments are not doing safety planning in an evidence-based way. We need to change that. A number of psychotherapies have been shown to be effective in, uh, in preventing suicide and suicide attempts. Um, they are not as available as they ought to be. Medications, uh, there are medications out there that actually seem to have an anti-suicidal effect. The big one is lithium. Um, and interestingly, what we're seeing is that the use of lithium has been going down, not up. And our trainees uh, oftentimes uh, aren't exposed enough to it. Same with, uh, same with clozapine and schizophrenia. Um, some newer um, uh, and interventions that are being tested, ketamine showing a lot of promise as a way to rapidly uh, turn around suicidal thinking. ECT has been with us for a while. We don't use it probably nearly enough in patients who are intensely suicidal. So what do we know? We need to pay more attention to these kind of things. We need to encourage access to evidence-based psychotherapy and, and make sure continue to search for treatments that will rapidly decrease suicidality. We also need to have ways to look at groups and, um, uh, you know, we're not doing it, especially for, for younger kids. Uh, there are very few randomized control trials. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about some of the other strategies, but then I really want to get to the end so we have some time for discussion. Um, if you look at at-risk groups and you think about what actually might help us prevent suicide in a large way. There is some promise for what we are calling gatekeeper training. That's where really you educate folks who are dealing with potentially high risk groups and you train them to identify individuals at risk and direct them to appropriate services. We do this in schools. You can do it in faith-based organizations, do it in the military. Um, the whole idea of maintaining connectedness is huge. And this is something that our healthcare system hasn't been good at and we need to get better at. But there's good data out there that frequent personalized continuous contacts after a suicide decrease completed suicide. Educating primary care providers in treating depression has been associated with decreasing suicide rates. Screening in the emergency department. And I, I really want to make the point here. We have had disproportionately low expectations of most EDs in the United States. Most don't have any specialized mental health uh, resources. Very few do universal screening. And yet there was recently a, a sort of a landmark study that reduced suicide rate, uh, suicide attempts by over 30% with a very brief intervention. Means restriction, we can certainly talk about that. That's important across the board. It's been shown to be effective with most of the time, not substitution of other attempts. Um, training our media. I, I, um, I, I must tell you, I, I recently just uh, finished an editorial uh, focused on 13 reasons why. Again, it's an empirical question whether it will result in, in uh, a greater number of suicides, but certainly there's plenty we know that um, that graphic rep representations of suicide or suicide methods, um, high drama, uh, can actually increase completed suicide in the aftermath. And again, population level efforts. So here's where I really, I, I think I, I would be inclined to finish up. What can we do here in West Virginia? How do we move to uh, what I'd call a zero suicide mindset here at WVU and in West Virginia? So a couple things. First thing is, why not? And I, I've been talking about this, and, and I think Gordon is very uh, excited about the idea. How do we make WVU the first suicide-free campus in the Big 12? And, uh, you know, I, 
will be very grateful for, for Gordon's a great communicator. And if anybody can persuade uh, his fellow college presidents of the importance of this issue, I, I think that, uh, that he will do that. Uh, there is a lot that we can be doing on this campus. Uh, my colleagues at the Carruth Center do a great job, and I think we can do even more. Um, so this is something that I think needs to be um, a, a big aspiration, a bold aspiration. I think we need to have zero suicide expectations across our health system. We need a better way of tracking events. Right now, even though we care about suicide, we care about overdoses, uh, our ability to really identify these problems in real time uh, so that we can respond in real time is really quite limited. We need to improve our ability to uh, track these events and to let the professionals who can respond do so uh, in real time. Uh, workforce training, cultural change. Um, you go to most inpatient psychiatric units uh, one of the main things we do, we're, we admit people because they're suicidal. And yet, the average unit doesn't really hone in there and pay a lot of attention to specific interventions to prevent suicide. We need to do more of that. We know it works. We know it's more helpful. Um, and we need to find a way to make sure that people in West Virginia have access to rescue interventions as we learn more about them, things like ketamine, things like ECT and frankly, things just like good, solid access to care. How do we make WVU a best practices hub? Not just for West Virginia, but for other places. Um, for mental health and addiction related crises. How do we make our ED a hub for um, mental health and addiction crisis management? How do we become a model for the rest of the state and maybe lead care across the state? And then how do we integrate these services across medical settings and really just take that whole zero suicide model and change the culture? And then finally, this is where a university can make a difference. This, it is about social capital. And that's the first bite towards uh, reducing adverse childhood experiences. I mean, I think we can go into great detail here, but in a very general way, we're in a privileged position. And I think we have the opportunity to focus on something that really deserves our focus if we start thinking right about it. And sadly, I'm not sure we have been. I'm going to um, stop here. Um, I have a slide or two here. I know many of you from time to time will come across individuals that you're concerned about who um, your concern may be suicidal. Um, certainly don't be afraid to ask them if they're thinking about killing themselves. That's not gonna increase the risk. If you are concerned, you wanna work to keep them safe. Be there, listen, don't dismiss the suicidality. Don't try and talk them out of it. Listen and then try and get them help. Help them connect and then stay connected. Um, there are some numbers here if folks uh, are dealing with someone or have to deal in, a, uh, in an acute crisis, there's a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline for veterans, for everybody else. And then our own Carruth Center um, is a tremendous resource. So I think I've, I've already gone a little bit longer than I wanted to. Uh, I'd like to stop here and we can go into things in more detail, but I'm just gonna stop and, and see if folks have any questions. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Nelson. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, to what extent is alcohol associated with this, given yeah. um, Native Americans, given Montana and Wyoming? Yep. What do you think? I mean, do you overlay alcohol abuse on suicide maps? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's, there's good reason to think that alcohol and suicide risk are, are really tightly related, right? So in, 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 a, in, a, in a complex way, in the, in, acutely, 
one of the things that we really caution our patients who are depressed or struggling with suicidal thoughts is to avoid being intoxicated. What happens when they become intoxicated? Some people actually become more intensely suicidal, but, but even, even more um, uh, troubling is they're more likely to behave impulsively um, and, um, uh, and do things like pull the trigger. It, it, am, am I am I answering the question? Yeah, I mean, no, I think no, that yeah, it's yeah, absolutely I, yeah. But I just wonder if, if there's a difference between say a WVU student or pediatric uh, suicide versus folks from 20 to 50 in terms of the alcohol abuse. You know, I I I don't know the answer. I think I think what I'd say is that someone who's a chronic user uh, ends up with. I mean, obviously, chronic users, there's an impact over time with their mood, with their uh, emotions, this sort of thing. Um, WVU students, that can happen as well. But I think the bigger, the bigger fear with, the, with younger people is that it's going to lead to an impulsive attempt. Thanks. Thanks. What do you think of adding microdose lithium to the drinking water? Ah. I, I think that there's been enough written out there that you that you got to wonder about it, right? Um, I, I I think that uh, I I think it it was hard enough getting fluoride in the water. I don't I don't I'm not I'm not counting on us being able to get lithium in the water, and I and I I don't know if it would be a good idea, but certainly you know I I mean there are studies out there that have showed that parts of the world where there is are higher levels of lithium in the in the drinking water, you can do maps and. It looks like in some of those studies that uh, there were reduced rates of suicide in those in those areas. Uh, I think it's an interesting idea. I I, th I think that there's probably a lot we could do before we go there. Thank you. Other questions? Thanks, John. That was Hi. Really wonderful. I uh, you know in some parts of the world and other cultures, suicides viewed very differently, right? So there are many. I'm sorry. In other parts of the world, in different yeah. cultures, suicides viewed differently. So yes. In, in a, there were times in, in uh, Eastern culture where suicide was an honorable way sometimes to end, end one's life. And in some cultures, even today, assisted suicide is done not uncommonly, right, for terminally mm -hmm. ill people. How does that factor into the U.S. You know, rates and the kind of things you're talking about yeah. compared to these other places? Well, you know, the cultural factors are important. I mean, we know that... Um, living in a culture where, where suicide is highly taboo, it does appear to be protective, right? It's not 100% protective. Religious faith, protective, right? Not 100% pr protective, right? So I, I think that there's something about these cultural taboos. You know, I, I found myself wondering now as we're, we're trying to call more attention to the issue, it's like how on the one hand do you demonstrate compassion and open up a dialogue for, okay, you know what? You're talking about suicide. Okay, let's talk about it. Let's engage over it. But then how do we then take it off the table as a quote unquote coping strategy? How do you say, you know what? Listen, I understand why you're talking about this as a way to uh, deal with the pain you're feeling. Now my job is to persuade you that it's not a coping strategy. We've got other coping strategies that, that we can use. We're taking it off the table. Um, some would argue there's a, there's a strong cultural component and a strong component of how do we think about the world and the universe? Yeah. Yes, sir. Given that uh, one of the groups with the highest are the veterans, if, if you remove veterans from your statistics, I wonder if all the correlations still hold, like, is West Virginia still high there? Is Montana still the highest state, et cetera? That's, that's a really, that's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer because I've not seen the numbers. What I can tell you is in the, in the study I was, I was showing you where we looked at county level suicide rates, what I can tell you is that uh, the higher the percentage of veterans in your county, the higher the suicide rate in the county. It was definitely, uh, it, it, it fell out of the regression as significant. So 
percentage of veterans matters, they're at, they're at greater risk. I don't know how the numbers would look if you pulled them out, though. It's a good question. Yes. I've been working in the field for four years now, and our psychiatrists have tend to not use the clozeril and lithium due to the physical aspects. Do you them and like everybody that? else, yeah. Yeah, because the physical health of our clients, they're not compliant with what is absolutely necessary yeah. with this medication because you have liver damage, white blood cell counts depleting. So mm -hmm. do you feel that that maybe is the reason that we're coming back from those medications? We're, well, I think, how to put it, it takes more effort from providers to prescribe lithium and clozeril than it does to prescribe, say, quetiapine, right? Um, except, you know, we've got, we've got data out there that... Um, these are the drugs that, that uh, give us the most bang for the dollar. So how to, how to answer this without, without sounding snotty? I think this is a mistake. We've started to look at this um, in, in at looking at claims data. What we've, what we've seen is that um, some states have actually turned the corner using Clauseril. We made a, a major effort on this in, um, in uh, Ohio. And it's not just about suicide, it's about better care for, for schizophrenia, you know? Um, so I think it's a training issue. I think it's a practice issue. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the data on lithium and uh, clozapine are pretty clear. So I guess um, if someone has a patient that's struggling why, why if, if you're up against it, wouldn't you prescribe lithium uh, as opposed to an anticonvulsant? I, I, I have a hard time justifying it. We had a clauseril program. We're up from Brook and Hancock counties where we travel from. Yeah. Um, where the clauseril, we had 15 clients, um, but only one of them was compliant with the medication blood yeah. group. So because of that, a lot of them ended up in the hospital for the yeah. white blood cell counts going down, liver counts, kidney counts going down. Yep. So we've always had that problem, although it's like the better solution. We've also found that in these high risk clients, it's very hard to deal with. Sometimes Have they done any type of research to kind of find mm -hmm. what's in it that is more effective so that we could find a different kind of medication? I, I think what people problem? are trying to do is find ways to make it easier for patients and easier for the prescribers, because it is a pain in the neck. So how do you create a system of care that makes it, I mean, as opposed to just saying, oh, well, the problem is the doctors or the problem is the patients. How do we develop a system of care that makes it easier uh, for it to happen, right? Uh, you know, th this is the argument people say, I don't want to put my suicidal patient on lithium because it, it can be highly lethal in overdose. Yeah, that is true, but... Um, it also may be the one way to uh, to uh, uh, change their thinking and their behavior. Thank you. Thank you. I'm curious oh, um, if you want to make WVU campus a zero suicide campus. Yeah. Do we know what the suicide rate is here on campus? Uh, I, I think we have that data. Now I haven't had my my nose in it. I I think that um, I think that I would say like any large college campus. I would be I would be highly surprised if there are there have been many years here where the number has been zero. Um, I, my my understanding is that as a county, if you look at the map in West Virginia, Monongalia County does way better. It has uh, among the lower rates in the state, right? Um, we still need to do better, but yeah, no, it's not zero. Yes. Hi, first of all, wonderful, informative oh, presentation. You. I'm curious to know, looking at the demographics, not only geographically, but where people are in the lifespan, what sleep hygiene, how that impacts suicide? Oh, sleep, sleep is huge. I mean, and I, I um, I got going fast there towards the end. If you look at, uh, people have looked pretty carefully at physical health problems that are associated with uh, 
a heightened risk of suicide. Sleep disorders fall out of that every time. So clearly problems with sleep, suicide, um, uh, huge connection, right? I was thinking, in ter- yes, that, but I was thinking in terms of uh, shift workers of the Midwest and mm-hmm. farmers and factory workers. And I, I think there's probably somebody in the audience that knows a whole lot more uh, about that than me. I, I don't know if you'd care to comment, Randy, about, uh, I, I don't know any data on shift work and suicide, though I would imagine it, it certainly doesn't help your mood. Yeah, uh, I don't know the answer. It's a great question. I just don't know the answer. Yes, thank you. Um, in your opinion, uh, what do you feel are the major barriers for suicide prevention at WVU? Oh, well, I, I mean, I think the easy answer is is probably how we think about it, right? Um, and and I don't mean other people, I mean, I mean me. I mean, I think that um, we've been living with high rates of suicide. It's like, how do, we, how do we change a system of care? How do we change how we live in a way that takes the problem seriously, right? So, I mean, again, I, I focused on emergency departments because I grew up in hospitals, right, uh, professionally. But, you know, if you think about it, I I show you the chart there, what kills young adults? Now, in our emergency departments, we have specialized programs for physical trauma. We have specialized programs. If you're coming in with chest pain, we have algorithms. If you have impending stroke, we have very well-worn pathways. Um, When it comes to things like addiction, overdose, suicide, we're considerably behind in, in those areas. So I think step one, and this is, this is the appeal to me about zero suicide, excuse me, because what it does is it says, wait a minute, the only acceptable number is zero. What are we doing about it? So. I, I guess what I'd say is I think the biggest barrier is us and uh, really beginning to think about the problem in a not fatalistic way, to think about the problem with a sense of hope and positive expectations. Uh, a lot of people actually hate the idea of zero suicide because it's sort of, ah, we'll never get there. Well, it's an empirical question. I mean, it, it'd be a neat trick if we did, right? So. I think more so what I'm occasionally um, like on campus at WVU, because I actually worked on a suicide prevention grant at WVU um, a couple years ago, mm-hmm. and a lot of our issues were organizational issues um, that were have... large barriers to us in mm-hmm. getting, um, you know, just cooperation with different departments so that we could move forward mm-hmm. on time and mm-hmm. actually reach the people that we wanted to reach. Yes. No. I what I what I'd say is. This is a ch- challenge everywhere. If it, if it helps at all, I don't want to um, uh, be an apologist. If it helps at all, I have found folks on the campus here very open and very interested in saying, OK, how can we do better? Are there going to be silos and barriers? Absolutely, right? This is a, this is a difficult human problem. And you know how do how do we how do we do it? There's not an easy roadmap either. We don't it, it, we don't have an instruction book necessarily. Um, but I, I hear what you're saying, and I'd be happy. Uh, I'd be delighted to talk with you. Come by and see me. I'm interested to hear what you think the barriers are and how do we um, uh, get around them or go through them. Great, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Sir. First of all, thank you for your your talk. Very thank informative. Um, I was interested in if there were any special economic factors that seem to stand out. I'm from Logan County, West Virginia, um, and I've always sort of thought that the the maps that we see of things like um, overdoses tend to very highly correlate with poor economic outcomes. And we mentioned certain factors like access to care yep. and uh, Medicaid status, but I was wondering if 
employment status yeah. um, was significant. Yeah, it definitely is significant, right? Um, if, if you look, um, you know, in, in, the, um, in the big county level suicide that I, I showed you some of the slides for, we developed an index uh, of, of economics. But if you look at un measures of unemployment, anything that tracks lower levels of education, and these things are all correlated, lower levels of education, lower levels of employment, uh, lower incomes, okay? And then things that often track with that, social fragmentation. All of these things, uh, they tend to cluster. Risk clusters, right? Um, I mean, I, we, did a, we did a study of, uh, of kids presenting in primary care with suicidal thoughts or uh, with, with thoughts of self-harm. And what was also interesting is the, ki the kids who presented with those thoughts were also more likely to have, in the last week, ridden in a car with somebody who was drunk, to have brought a weapon to school, uh, to, uh, you know, to been involved with an, uh, you know, an unintended pregnancy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think unemployment and, you know, how do you, I, I, one of the, the folks at the state um, that I, I met with last week with Jeff Coben from Public Health, he, he, said, he said to me, so how do you measure hope? You know, it's a great question, but I think in a lot of ways, all these things uh, uh, contribute to this sense of um, things aren't going to get better, you know, and that's something we got to crack. So thank you. We just got one. Okay. Oh, we had one more. Okay. Can we take, can we take one more? Here we go. Thanks. Sorry. I'm perfect. sorry. Um, so I feel like one of the shocking statistics is always the adolescent suicide rates yes. starting so young. Yeah. Do you think that there's a way that we could address adolescent suicide in our education systems in a different way? Maybe that would lower the rates. I know it's a touchy yeah. subject. Especially. Yeah, no, people are doing things, right? So mm -hmm. I had showed you some slides about things like um, gatekeeper training, right? Uh, I know a number of schools are doing things like um, um, training students, training faculty. And some of the data on the gatekeeper training, uh, things like signs of suicide, uh, things like that, they, they do seem to be protective. So people are doing things like that. Uh, interestingly, there are, there are a lot of things. I didn't go into any detail, but there are things like um, beginning in school, there, there's this thing called the good behavior game, right? Where you train uh, kids in elementary school. It's, it's, it's essentially like a token economy that rewards uh, social support and, and positiveness. Interestingly, in East Baltimore, they've followed that cohort. It seems to be associated with lower suicide rates and a variety of other positive outcomes. So I think there are a lot of things that we can be doing and thinking about doing Again, not not well tested enough, but but there are things out there, and and I agree with you. We want to begin young. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm sorry. Did you? I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. Um, hi, I work hi. with um, nonprofits in Morgantown with low income families, and uh -huh. um, I I feel like the families that we work with are they're very at risk families, lot, and there's high presence of ACEs with most of these kids that yes. I deal with. But these families that I'm working on and helping, they don't see the university as a friend to uh -huh. them. Um, so I think there's a disconnect here between the populations that need it yes. most and the people that have the resources to do right. something about it. Right. And I feel like if there's a way that we can bring these people together and show that like the university actually isn't the enemy and can yep. do things to help the community. I want, I guess I'm asking what like, can we do collaboratively with the community, right. get them involved, get the university actually out doing things for people who really need it. Do you, and so I, I don't know like what organizations or programs are already in place right. here. So that's a disconnect that I'm seeing. And I think, was wondering what we can do to address that. Well, it's a great question. And what I'd say is I think we've got to begin by sitting down with people and, and, just, and just meeting with them. And I think that there's a lot of room here in, in this region for, for advocacy, right? I, I was really 
pleased to learn that there is now a, um, uh, an American Foundation for Suicide Prevention chapter here. So th there are organizations that maybe can bring people, you know, sort of town and gown together. And um, I, I, I think that's, that's really critical. So happy to talk to you, happy to talk to anybody about that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Done. I hope so. I hope so. Well, I, I tried to put no, 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 10 pounds so. in a five pound bag. No, 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 so. no, I learned a whole lot. That oh, was good. Really, I hope really, so. I like I hope so. perspective so much. Oh. 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 O